We're here to make a new type of news. New insights, new styles, and new topics every day. We are News Generation. Making news just for you. It's March 31st here in Seoul. I'm Shin Yeun, and this is News Generation, where we make the news at Arirang's very own open studio. Every morning, we'll discuss the top issues and latest current affairs affecting people in their 20s and 30s. Joining me in the studio is Kim Xiang. Good morning, yeah. And Niall Song. Good morning. And both are here to speak on behalf of those in their 20s and 30s. Now, we're going to start with the news feed that covers different hashtags and news items that have been trending on social media over the past 24 hours. And the first hashtag is Cherry Tomatoes. Recently, many people in South Korea felt nauseous or threw up after eating cherry tomatoes. And the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety said it would look into it. And on Thursday, officials found that this season's cherry tomatoes, specifically the type HS2106, were harvested in January when average temperatures were 3 degrees Celsius lower than usual. So this specific line of tomatoes produced more tomatin, a substance found among unripe tomatoes making the taste bitter. And the government has identified which farms harvested this line of tomatoes tomatoes and are now recalling them nationwide. And the second hashtag is cheetah. India has announced the birth of four cubs to one of the eight cheetahs that were relocated from Namibia in southern Africa. India's environment minister tweeted a photo and video of the cubs on Wednesday, calling it a momentous event because cheetahs have basically been declared extinct in this South Asian country. And the last hashtag is Chonuwan, the grandson of the former Korean president Chun Doohan. Now, we mentioned earlier this week that the 27-year-old grandson flew into Korea from the States to apologize to the victims of the 1980 military crackdown his grandfather led. Now, Chun was released Wednesday after police investigated him for around 38 hours for alleged illegal drug use. But instead of why he came to Korea and the fact that he had been detained, many paid more attention to his looks. Now, some left comments saying that he looked like an actor. Others said that we should be more forgiving because he's handsome. Now, why don't we talk more in depth about the third hashtag as soon as Chun was released from police investigations, he went straight to Gwangju like he promised. And here's what he said as soon as he arrived. And Chun is scheduled to meet with civic groups from the pro-democracy uprising on Friday. And I would like to ask our panelists in the studio what they think about this news item, starting with Nael. Now, what do you think about Chun's arrival in Korea and his efforts to apologize for his grandfather's wrongdoings? You know, my dad's family is actually from Gwangju and growing mm -hmm. up learning about the uprisings and the fight for democracy, I understand mm -hmm. how emotional people, why people are still emotional against the Chun family and it's just really weird to me that people would be focusing on things like the looks at this point in right. time you know about his double eyelid surgery mm. his hair loss medication like why do we care about that so much you Definitely. know when this is actually a big deal and we should actually be paying more attention to his intent and the lifestyle that he led so it's it's baffling to me. Yeah, I was quite startled to also look through all these tweets about Chun Won and a lot of people focused on his looks. Yeah, as and you saying we should forgive him because he's handsome. I know. And that's why, Xiong, I would like to ask you, do you think Chun's actions actually mean something to the victims of the 1980 pro-democracy movement? I mean, personally, uh, I think it does have meaning to the victims of the mm. May 18th Gwangju uh, Democratic Uprising. It was an entirely unjust massacre of civilians by Chun Doan who took over the country via military coup d'etat on the 17th of May 1980. Chan was actually sentenced to life in prison and fined 220 Mm -hmm. 0.5 billion won, which amounts to around 180 million US dollars, uh, by the Supreme Court in 1997 on charges of high treason, mutiny, and bribery. John refused to pay his fine his entire life until he died in 2021, making a mockery of not only the May 18th uh, survivors, but the entire country by claiming he only has $200 in his accounts mm -hmm. uh, while still living a lavish life on luxury golf courses and his multi-million dollar house. His grandson, John Won, is not a different case. He also lived a lavish life, uh, going to a luxury private school in the US, also finishing his university degree 
uh, in New York State whilst living in a you know high-rise building, uh, also a luxury estate, 71 floors. Uh, and it doesn't quite make sense that the offspring of such a family of crime and uh, illegally claimed wealth is gaining such attention for just drug use uh, and receiving some a positive sentiment from uh, what might be a small percentage of the Korean public. The apology from the Chun family is also an extremely belated one mm -hmm. and shouldn't be treated as a heroic gesture at all by any means. Granted, the belated apology does have meaning, uh, but it should not let Chun Won off the hook for his public attention-seeking attitude, you know, which, extremely, which shows the extremely unstable size mm -hmm. of him screaming and jumping right. around in his self-filmed videos whilst under, you know, extremely excessive use of right. illegal substances. Right. And uh, if he truly wants to repent, as he claims, I think the best way to go about it is quietly, mm -hmm. you know, repaying the sum of fine that still needs to be paid uh, right. with his father if, if mm -hmm. it's going to be making any amends. Definitely. And apologizing in a more quiet mm -hmm. and private manner rather than going on television you know, asking for a press conference, you know, as soon as he arrives at the airport. There's definitely a lot of controversy. Doesn't make sense. Exactly, on how he's handling this. But a lot of local media outlets are looking into the fact that he's the one and only person from this Chun household to be visiting the May 18th mm. Memorial Foundation in Gwangju. So our attention is geared there. And let's change topic to today's discussion topic, that is. And you may have heard this number over the past few weeks, 0 0.78. To find out what this is, take a listen. 0.78, that's the fertility rate in South Korea. And it not only ranks bottom among OECD countries, it's actually the lowest in the world. To tackle this problem, the UN administration convened a presidential committee meeting on Tuesday to come up with constructive solutions. For the first time in eight years, the president of South Korea directly presided over a meeting to come up with ways to improve the birth rate. He also criticized the government spending of some $215 billion over the past 15 years, only for the downward trend to continue. The committee selected five key areas to tackle to push up the birth rate. They are childcare and education, better workplace policies, housing support, child-rearing expenses and medical costs. Some applauded the president's efforts to raise low birth rate issues as an urgent national agenda item. But many, especially the younger generation, said it shouldn't be the state that is responsible for their children. It should be them. That's why some are demanding better infrastructure and an environment where they can confidently and comfortably choose to raise kids. Today, NewsGen looks at three questions. One, what do millennials, Gen Z and Korea think about the low birth rate problem and the latest solutions provided by the government? Two, what type of changes or measures do they want to see? Three, how are other countries trying to boost birth rates? What are some welfare policies Korea could implement to encourage more people to have kids? As we just saw, the low birth rate poses a severe problem for Korea to the extent that the president himself presided over a meeting and specifically said this is a priority that requires a lot of time and attention. Now, Xiao, why don't you first explain to us the gravity of the situation and what type of consequences or societal drawbacks can low birth rate have? Yeah, I mean, uh, South Korea's low birth rate has garnered the attention of both domestic and international society. Korea now has the lowest birth rate in the world and expected to have severe consequences related to the expected demographic changes. Let's have a look at the trend of figures to see the gravity of the situation. Only a decade ago, South Korea had more than 485,000 new births and a respectable average of 1.3 children per woman of childbearing age. This figure dramatically uh, reduces starting from 2016 at 406,000 new births and 1.17 fertility rate hitting uh, the 300,000 bar in 2019, as well as a fertility rate of below one. Last year, we saw a record-breaking low birth rate at 249,000 new births and 0.78 child per female. Such low birth rates 
have obvious consequences such as economic decline due to reduced workforce as well as an aging population that could have negative consequences in the near future. And that's why officials have decided to pick and choose which areas need improvement to boost birth rates. And if you take a look at the screen, I've summarized the main points of their recently proposed solutions and there are five key areas that will mm. be tackled. The first is in childcare and education. Officials pledge to give more stipends to help pay for daycare or baby babysitting services for households with two or more kids. They also said they would give incentives for childcare centers accepting newborns. And the second area they'll work on is better working conditions for parents. They'll allow them with kids up to age 12 to reduce their working hours. And this used to only be an option for parents with kids up to eight years old. Now, if you take a look at the second uh, chart that I have for you, the next set of policies will provide better housing support. 430,000 units will be allocated for newlyweds by 2027. Housing subscriptions will be open for households with at least two kids. Now, keep in mind this used to be three. And the government also said they would bump up the parental allowance from 700,000 won per month to a million won. And that's around $765. And lastly, they said they would cover all hospital fees for children younger than 24 months. So you guys just you guys just saw the set of proposals yeah. they mm -hmm. had right there. But now, what did you think about them? Yeah, well, I think they're great and it's a great step towards the future. And I personally think that Korea's pregnancy and birth Birthing situation is quite okay mm -hmm. and we have really good postpartum care centers and it's great that they're focusing on daycare and babysitting services nowadays we see Walter he's another panelist right. and right. he's always lacking in sleep and time. yeah and Getting I would two hours of sleep a day yeah. right two mm -hmm. hours how are how are we supposed to be happy parents if you know if we don't get anything uh, any mental or physical sure. support so anything that's supporting parents, new parents in that way, I support. So you think this is in the light of the right direction? Yeah, I sure, I think so. Mm -hmm. But what about you, Xiong? Yeah, I mean, I also think this, these are fantastic. In mm -hmm. my opinion, education and housing are the two, you know, the paramount importance uh, of uh, policies that would boost the birth rate. I mean, tangible childcare support, parents' working conditions, as you mentioned, and monetary allowances are great as well. Especially the coverage, uh, I think, of all hospital fees up to 24 months, mm -hmm. I think is a fantastic mm. uh, support system That's for great. new parents as well. Mm -hmm. But why do you think we're still seeing low birth rates? I mean, Korea does have a lot of good birth and welfare mm, yes. policies related to it. But millennials and members of Gen Z don't think that it's the state's responsibility. Mm -hmm. They think it's their responsibility, yeah. right? Yeah. So why don't you guys provide ideas to tackle like birth rates? And what would make you want to have kids here in Korea, starting with Xiong? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think the first and foremost importance uh, would be to increase the general wage levels uh, before anything. Mm -hmm. You know, government support should be provided, personally, I think, in infrastructure reform, mm. uh, rather than blindly handing out cash that cannot be guaranteed to be used for childcare by the parents in the first place. Mm -hmm. Of course, certain, you know, high qualification jobs are indeed high paying in international standards as well in South Korea. Uh, but Korea still remains well below uh, the OECD average right. of wages. Mm. Korea also for 26 years in a row has ranked the first place in the gender wage gap among all OECD countries. Wow. Depressive financial situation and societal gap will continue to stagnate the citizens' willingness mm -hmm. to bear children. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And Nell, any ideas that you might have? Yeah, I just want to add on to what Xiong was saying about education. I personally think it's one of the biggest problems I see in raising children here in Korea. And if you want your kids to succeed, it's a common understanding that you need to send them to an English kindergarten right. for them to yeah. actually speak Eng English, be bilingual, or even trilingual mm -hmm. to succeed. And it's unfortunate because sending these kids to private English kindergartens can Very cost parents expensive. thousands thousands of dollars for parents each month. But the fact that this private education and exposure to multicultural and multilingual education already puts these kids ahead of their peers, you know, those who cannot afford it, it's, it's unfortunate and quite frankly unfair. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, but I think mm -hmm. in a bigger picture, not on a personal level, even many developed nations that have very good, uh, good welfare policies, they right. don't necessarily have really high fertility mm -hmm. rates. And I think if they have turned towards uh, migration policies, right. and that's something that we also need to focus here in Korea yeah, to better the point, lives of immigrant, uh, marriage immigrants, migrant yeah. workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think these are really good points. And if I sum up what you guys were saying, so wage, education, mm -hmm. and migration policies. And let's see how feasible these solutions are by including a social researcher in our discussions.
As President Yoon Song-nyeol addressed himself, hearing from millennials and Gen Z on what they think is the best way to tackle societal issues like low birth rate is key. But to what extent are their creative ideas feasible? Let's find out from Pek ji a social researcher at the University of St. Andrews, whose research interests include fertility. Now, ji it's our second time having you on our show. Welcome back. Thank you so much for Welcome having me back, today Chizan. again. All right, Thank Chisan, you. so as you may have heard, Chiyoung and Nile have proposed a few of their ideas to tackle low birth rate. They also spoke on behalf of the younger generation. And as a researcher, how feasible do you think their proposals are? Um, I agree with all the points that you made, but I also appreciate the idea of an education system for retired individuals to become mm. babysitters. Mm. But we need to ensure this policy does not reinforce existing gender roles by mm. only relying on retired women. Yeah. Instead, we should explore ways to activate the labor market to support child care without reinforcing gender roles. Mm, I see. I think that's a very important mm -hmm. point you made right there. Then what do you think about the UN administration's latest proposal to tackle birth rates? So yeah, I think the proposal is a step in the right direction but mm -hmm. it seems to be based on existing policies with changes focused on just numbers, like uh -huh. increasing this, increasing that. Yeah. So to address this long-term issue, we need a revolution, not just incremental changes. Mm -hmm. I hope that this proposal can be improved, uh, improved to address the fundamental and structural problems that exist in civil aspects of mm -hmm. Korean society. Mm -hmm. And Chiyo, you mentioned a very interesting point too. You mentioned the wage gap between genders, right? How do you think this has to do with the topic of discussion? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, of course, Jisun just mentioned a very good point, mm -hmm. especially in elderly as providing childcare, and I think that grants them an opportunity for re-employment in later age as well. I think that's also fantastic. But the you know the wage gap as well as gender roles right. uh, in a traditionally sort of patriarchal society like Korea, I think one of the biggest problem here is also uh, in SMEs, small to medium enterprises. Mm -hmm. You know these policies don't really matter. You know right. the the maternity leave, paternity leave isn't guaranteed, and if women uh, get pregnant and want to leave, take a leave in a small to medium enterprise, they get frowned upon. Right. I mean, I think that's also a societal change that we need yeah. to see before actually talking about the implementation of these new exactly. policies. Sure. And that's why, ji I want to ask you, do you think gender issues <coughs> are one of the reasons behind South Korea's low birth rate compared to other parts of the world? Yes, definitely. Actually, I was just thinking about uh, this, you know, gender issues especially gender roles or discrimination against women. Um, I believe this discrimination against women in the labor market amplifies gender roles. Because mm -hmm. South Korea actually is at the very bottom of the glass ceiling index among OECD countries, yeah. uh, which measures the gender equality in the workforce. Mm -hmm. But this discrimination against women is pushing men and father to have more pressure and reinforcing the gender roles. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if mom quits the job to take mm -hmm. care of the baby, it's the father who takes the responsibility to earn more money. So I think that was a very valid point. Mm. All right. And lastly, what do you think, Jisun, are some birth rate policies implemented abroad that have been found to be very effective? Um, I would like to talk about a policy in the UK where mm. people who are not legally married can also receive support for fertility treatment. Mm. In Korea, however, the government only provides support for this treatment to married couples right. based on the culture that giving birth without marrying is considered taboo. Mm -hmm. I believe this belief is hindering the adoption of more progressive policies. Mm -hmm. So if Korean society shift away from this belief, there will be various ways to improve birth rate, I believe. I think that connects well with what Niall mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. too, that we shouldn't just be focusing on trying to raise birth rates, but mm -hmm. looking into other options as well, like yeah. migration. migration policies. And, you know, because there are a lot of people as a, on the earth as a total, but, you know, bringing them into our country will exactly. definitely raise the population. <laughs> All right. And thank you so much, Jisun. It was a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank, thank you so you much. Very much. Thank you, Jisun. All right. And Jisun made a lot of fascinating mm. points. Shio, any <clears throat> that caught your attention? 
<laughs> I think uh, it's piece He's of, having a little bit of a <laughs> coughing thing. Right, yes. <laughs> yes. But uh, <clears throat> apologies for that. But I think uh, Jizan made some great points. Mm -hmm. I think uh, what I actually took away from it was the last comment she made. And mm -hmm. I think I mentioned it in the previous episode where we dealt mm -hmm. with birth rate as well. Mm -hmm the concept of civil partnership mm -hmm. uh, in the UK it's been a common place as well mm -hmm. and you can definitely get child support mm -hmm. uh, for an unmarried couple as well uh, under a civil partnership right I think that might be a great potential uh, policy for South Korea as well mm -hmm. where you can you know alleviate the the burden of having to go through proper mm -hmm. a legal marriage and you know having to have children after that mm -hmm. but you know just lower the barrier and make everything a bit more you know relaxed and be let everyone have allow a chance to have children without actually being properly married as well. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Niall? You know, it was fascinating that she brought in the whole gender roles and how it's being more emphasized because, you know, mothers stay home and then fathers have this pressure to earn more so their wages go up. And it, yeah, I think that's, some, that's an issue that should not be ignored when we're talking about this issue. All right. And why don't we now hear from what our viewers have to say on today's discussion topic. Here's some of their suggestions to tackle low birth rates. If you take a look at the screen, we chose three. Art said fewer people means less competition and more opportunities for us. We'll also be better valued as individuals and citizens. Citizens. Hebaragi said the government needs to build safer public daycare centers where mothers can entrust their babies and make a law which allows couples with babies to take parental leave without feeling guilty. I think that's a very good point right there. Kuyoshi said instead of giving money to parents, we should be focusing on preventing people from not wanting kids, reduce work hours, affordable housing, better work policies, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, based on what our viewers have to say, I think this will go very well with our mm -hmm. final yeah. thoughts. So if you decide to have kids in Korea, what do you guys want to see in terms of policy making or societal changes before you do? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with Cool Yoshi's comment the most as well. And uh, I mean, I think childbearing happens with or without government support. Mm -hmm. And it has been happening like that in, in, in con con conventional terms as well. Right. So, I, you know, I personally also don't want to rely 100% on uh, public provision mm -hmm. uh, for, sure. for child support to raise my children as I want to be able to provide for them myself. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think most couples think the same way. Mm -hmm. Right. And if the potential parents themselves cannot afford a financially comfortable life right. mm -hmm. for themselves at this stage, it'll definitely hinder the likelihood mm -hmm. of them ha wanting to bear children uh, in the near future as well. So right. public policies are great, but it should be remembered that every penny is paid for by the citizens as well. Mm -hmm. right. So I mean, you know, as I mentioned before, rather than blinding you doing cash payments mm -hmm. if we can actually you know turn to the root of the problem right and have a better economic situation for, for all sure. citizens uh, young citizens as well. I think definitely. that will definitely kick up, boost and the very birth briefly, rate. Niall, do you mm. agree to what Xiong just said? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. <laughs> I think just aiming towards being more independent and financially, or just whether in time, I'm personally doing that. You know, pursuing the whole freelancer right. life to be able to spend more time with my family. All right, and why don't we end today's discussion? Making a better environment for the next generation is the agenda we're trying to achieve, and we'll be here every day from 9:30 a.m. to 10 a.m. Korea time, bringing you the topics that young people are talking about. Special thanks to Kim Shion. My pleasure, yeah. And Niall Song. No problem. And thank you everyone for watching. We'll see you next week. We are New, New Generation. Generation.